Hello, my horde. Uh, today's story, like many to come, begins with me taking a trip to Ollie's. I was hunting around to make sure I found all the My Little Pony books that they had, um, and I saw <laughs> this one. Uh, I thought, oh, cool, I never realized Descendants had books. I should grab that. And here we are. <laughs> The Isle of the Lost, written by Melissa de la Cruz, is a prequel to the first Descendants film, and it was originally published in either April or May of 2015. Uh, Google and Goodreads disagreed on the exact date of publication, and that's about as uh, much research as I did on the topic, since there's only a year in the books. Um, so the film apparently premiered on July of 2015, um, despite that there there is an advertisement in this book that is advertising for September 2015. But you know, things change after things go to print, so what can you do? Now given some information from the author's note, it seems that the author was both given the script and given a tour of set to better be able to describe some costumes and some places, uh, which is actually more than most authors get when writing the novelization of a film. So that's a cool thing to hear. So this book does some wonderful things for my little lore absorbing brain, because obviously when you watch these films, you don't get quite as much of a taste of what their lives were like before the villain kids were sent to Oridon. And like, frankly, the films aren't interested in any part of Oridon past what the kids are doing, which is all well and good. But I do like to think about the rest of the world sometimes. And uh, this book picks up a lot of that world building that you miss out on in favor of those grand musical numbers. The main story takes place on the titular Isle of the Lost and actually chronicles how the four villain kids first became a frenemy group, uh, including an adventure to find Maleficent's scepter, thus explaining why she has it in the film, even though you'd think they would take that away from her, even with the no magic dome over the island, like, just in case. There is also a side story about Prince Ben, but I'm gonna be honest, it's pretty thin, even though it does try very much to give Ben, like, an ounce more personality than he actually has. Overall, Isle of the Lost is a fun read. Uh, so honestly, if you like Descendants already and you like easy middle grade reads, this is for you. You will like it, and you will appreciate the extra taste of the world that you already care for. It also does the most to name drop almost every Disney villain and their minions. Like, even the hyenas from The Lion King get a shout out, uh, and I'm the kind of person who finds that totally charming. If you don't feel like you want to read this book, but you do kind of know what happens, then the next part of this video is for you. For here, we jump into spoiler territory. So the book starts off with a prologue to briefly tell us how King Beast, because they still refuse to give Beast a name, give Beast a name, 2023, thank you, Disney. He banished all the villains from the United States of Oridon to the Isle of the Lost and covered it with an anti-magic dome. At the time of the prologue, the villains were banished 10 years ago, and little Evie is having her sixth birthday party, to which Mal was not invited. Mal's mother, Maleficent, leader of the island because she's scary, although she is played by Kristen Chenoweth in these films, so uh, you do have to imagine her as the one standing on the balcony and screaming uh, when Maleficent banishes little Evie and her mother, the evil queen, from society or else. Another 10 years later, Mal has a dream about the picnic scene that happens in the film, uh, and she wakes up like, ew, what was that? I don't want to go to Oridon. Mal gets up and starts to go about her day. We get really wonderful descriptions of how run down everything on the island is. This is a place that is essentially a floating garbage dump. All their food is spoiled, so their eateries are places called things like the slop shop. Uh, Mal does thievery and vandalism and meets up with Jay, son of Jafar. Jay and Mal compare and trade stolen items as they walk to school, and Jay tells Mal that there's going to be a new kid today. When Mal realizes that the new kid is Evie, she decides to throw a party and not invite Evie as petty revenge. Mal bullies Carlos into holding the party at his house, Hell Hall, because his mother is away for the week. 
Uh, there's a lot of fun puns and jokes here about what kinds of classes the villain kids take. Things like evil schemes and advanced vanities, uh, and AP being advanced penchant for evil. Um, I love it. I love it the way I love the word every pony. Evie accidentally sits in Mal's seat, but Carlos takes pity on her and calls her to sit by him. Evie notices a device that Carlos is working on and is able to identify that he's trying to make a battery. So they form a tentative bond when Carlos tells her he's trying to poke a hole in the dome. Mostly just to try to get some different TV channels because inside the dome they only get these two channels, uh, one of which is just King Beast telling them not to be evil. During the day, Mal decides it isn't revenge enough to just not invite Evie to the party, and invites her with a plan to get the revenge at the party. The revenge being that once they're both at the party, Mal gets everyone's attention by calling for a game of seven minutes in heaven when Evie arrives, and then shoving her into Corella's fur closet, which is full of bear traps. Evie manages to safely make it to the other side of the closet, where there is another door and Carlos is waiting for her. He and Evie end up forsaking the rest of the party and go to Carlos's treehouse with the device he has been working on. They turn it on and it burns a hole into the top of the treehouse, and for a brief moment, Carlos's TV can pick up several channels from Oradon. But the light on the device fades and the channels fade back out too. After the party, Mal goes home to find her mother's raven Diablo has been returned from being turned to stone. Maleficent insists that Diablo says he saw the dragon's eye scepter and saw it glowing with magic, so Mal is tasked with going to find it. Jay comes over that night and Mal tells him about the return of Diablo and the dragon's eye. Jay doesn't really believe her, but when he comes home, his father starts to remind him about how they've always been searching for the big score, leading Jay to start to think that maybe the scepter really is on the island and he can steal it and make his father proud. Mal and Jay end up deciding to set off on a quest to try to find the dragon's eye. And since Mal knows whoever touches the staff will be cursed to sleep for a thousand years, she decides to talk Evie into going so she can trick her into taking the curse. Evie, knowing what she does about Carlos's device, tells Mal and Jay about it, so they drag Carlos along too. The villain kids bribe their way into the school's forbidden library to find a map of the island, and once they finally activate the invisible ink, they can see out in the misty part of the island that some people call Nowhere is marked the Forbidden Fortress, Maleficent's former home. Which honestly, bad move on King Beast's part, allowing any part of the villain's old homes to be on the island intact. Using Carlos's device as a compass, the kids set out, facing such trials as cutting back thorn bushes and spraying away bugs and slipping around in the mud until they finally come to a bridge to the castle. The stone griffins guarding the bridge come to life and start giving Carlos riddles about his mother. Inside the castle, they run into a room that becomes the Cave of Wonders and starts filling with sand until Jay can remember his father's golden rule being whoever has the most gold makes the rules, of course. Finally, there is a test for Evie. They come upon a mirror that turns them all old, and Evie has to recite her mother's spell, The Peddler's Disguise, so they can turn back to themselves. They reach Maleficent's throne room, although the throne has been removed. Mal stands where the throne once was to find where her mother would have hidden the dragon's eye within her own sight. Evie is closest when they see it and begins to reach for it. Mal has a crisis of conscience and ends up snatching the scepter first. Mal momentarily passes out while having a vision of when her mother cursed Sleeping Beauty, and she has some pity for her mother, who she really feels was just hurt to be left out. When Mal comes back to, the dragon's eye is gone, and the other kids said it has disappeared. Mal accuses Jay of taking it, and he admits that this was his intent, but that he doesn't have it. Mal realizes that the curse didn't work on her because being Maleficent's child, she is part dragon. Evie calls Mal out for originally planning to let her take the curse. Uh, Mal admits it, but can't come up with a reason for why she didn't go through with it. Evie ends up telling Mal that she had asked her mother to invite her to the party, but the Evil Queen had refused due to her feud with Maleficent. A feud based on the fact that Evil Queen had challenged Maleficent for power on the island, but had lost. The kids all kind of bond over the shared trauma of what they just went through, and they head home empty-handed. 
Each kid comes home to a parent expressing what a disappointment they are. But when Mal gets home to tell her mother that she doesn't have the dragon's eye, she finds Maleficent already has it, saying Diablo brought it to her and Mal failed. But the scepter is broken since it has no magic. When Mal tells Maleficent what happened, she just claims Mal touching the scepter must have broken it. After getting told off, the kids all meet back up and get up to mischief in the formation of the closest thing to friendship any of them has had. Okay, so then also interspersed through all of that is this little bit of story with Prince Ben. He has, of course, had a dream about Mal he keeps thinking about, which is distracting him from his preparations to become king. The sidekicks of the kingdom have essentially unionized and are petitioning the king for reasons such as none of them get paid for the work that they do, and Cinderella won't give the woodland creatures a break from making dresses. King Beast has decided that Ben should handle this situation as training, and makes Ben arrange a meeting with the various parties with complaints. Seeing as the meeting involves dwarves, mermaids, mice, and Pongo and Perdita, who are concerned about putting their puppies through college, the meeting quickly devolves into people talking over each other, and Prince Ben ends up standing up on the table and yelling to get everyone's attention. This, of course, does not go over well. He hangs out with his girlfriend, Audrey, after this incident, and sort of starts to realize that she doesn't seem to care about anything outside of herself. She has no interest in talking with him about the struggles with the meeting, and even less interest when he asks if she ever thinks about the villains. Also, somehow their song is just Audrey's parents' song, Once Upon a Dream, as she is the daughter of Sleeping Beauty, and I don't know why, but I'm just like, ooh, cringe. I just am. <laughs> ben, get out. Oh wait, he does. No thanks to Audrey, Ben finally figures out what he should do, and after drafting up solutions to every single one of the sidekick's problems, he meets up with the union again. But this time, they send just one representative, Grumpy the Dwarf. One-on-one, -on -one, Ben presents solutions like, I've set up a college fund for Dalmatian puppies, the mermaids should charge one silver to give tours of Atlantica, and the dwarves get to keep half of what they mine. Oh, and the mice get Saturdays off or something like that? At the end of the meeting, Grumpy even tells Ben he thinks he will be a good king. So all is well, and Ben has atoned for not only his slights, but the slights caused by his father in the first place, arguably. Having had to think very much about the way other people live, Ben still finds himself thinking about the villains and the children that he has heard about living on the island. And so the book ends with him coming up with his brilliant idea to have the villain kids come to Oradon Prep, which is the inciting incident of the movie. What I like about Ben's little very interruptive storyline is that it certainly gives us a better look at the rest of Oradon than the first film does. Realizing that King Beast doesn't think about the sidekicks and servants of his kingdom really any more than he does about the villains, and actually seeing a little bit of the implications of that is cool world building. Since it's from Ben's perspective, you can actually watch him start thinking about his own privilege, and when he realizes not everyone in Auradon lives the way he does. It gives a nice foundation for the character, because in the film he just comes across like, oh, this is just because he's just too good. Um, whereas here you can feel like he genuinely had an eye-opening experience that led to his sense of justice differing from his father's. Of course, the movie isn't about him, so it really doesn't matter how he decided that the villain kids deserved a chance. But for the reader, I think it's a nice layer to look back at the film with, you know, or forward to if you happen to be a kid who had snatched this up before the film even came out, or, you know, if you haven't seen them yet and you go to read this book now. So I didn't have the best memory of all the extra side villain kids that crop up in the second and third movie, but upon a brief Google of the ones in the book that I wasn't sure about, they did in fact pop up with photos of the actors portraying them, so genuinely this author was given a, le a lot of access. Um, or it was decided to pluck the characters uh, from the book, which would be really cool, but either way, it does cement this book as intentional canon world-building and not just disposable cash grab. 
There are three more in the series, and I intend to read them. Being written for preteens, these are a pretty fast read for me as an adult, and I really found it enjoyable. Mal getting mad at Jay for stealing her stolen coffee, but then just giving it to him because it tastes horrible, is the kind of hilarity I need in my life right now. That's all I have to say about this book. If you're new here and you liked this review, there are several more on my channel and more to come under the playlist Let's Read with Labby Dragon. And with all of that said, I will see you treasures next time. I got makeup on my hand. Ha <laughs> ha